My name is Heather Vokush, and thank you for joining us tonight. Over 1.5 million Americans are diagnosed with cancer each year, and over 560,000 die every year. What we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at artists who have used their art in order to help heal from cancer and also to help heal other people. It's going to be a very, very inspiring segment. Now, we are delighted to be joined tonight by Yuko Kodama. Yuko Kodama is a 37-year-old uh, Brooklyn she lives in Brooklyn. Um, she is an artist. She is a yoga instructor. And she got a Kickstarter.com grant and is doing an exhibition, a series of paintings and different kinds of art, and is going to have an exhibition at some point based on that. And we have asked Yuko to share some of her art with us today. Now, the next person that we would like to look at who had cancer is a gentleman named Grant Ritchie. Grant Ritchie was in New York for a while. He was an actor and a teacher. Now, the Minneapolis Post described Grant Ritchie as, quote, a natural and fearless comedian, a generous soul, and someone who refused to let cancer get him down. Now, unfortunately, Grant Ritchie lost his battle to cancer in, on Thanksgiving Day 2009. He was 49 years old. But joining us today to help us learn more about Grant Ritchie and his fight with cancer and indeed his art around cancer is Judy Hennigan. Judy Hennigan is an actor and a comedian and a writer who makes her home in Los Angeles. Now, originally she's from the Midwest. Uh, she was born in Chicago, moved to Wisconsin, and honed her comedic skills in Minneapolis. Now, Judy Hennigan and, Grant, and Grant Ritchie were partners. They were comedic partners in a wonderful group called Martini and Olive, and we will learn more about that as the show progresses. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, both of you, for being here today. Now, we would like to begin with you, Yuko. Okay. If, if you could describe a little bit about when did you find out that you had cancer? Well, um, I got the official diagnosis after I had my surgery in um, January of, I guess it would be 2000 and... Um, nine or ten I can't remember That's okay. God, I'm sorry yeah. the That's years okay. yeah it must have been um, 2009 sorry and then um, I had this lump behind my tooth um, and I discovered it you know growing in 2008 like a uh, around September and they thought that I needed to get my wisdom tooth pulled out because it was behind my wisdom tooth and then I got the wisdom tooth pulled out but it kept growing and growing and then mm -hmm. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't because I ate too much popcorn, which is why they <laughs> said I had the swelling. And then by the time, mm -hmm. you know, I thought like this is something really unusual. It was just so big mm -hmm. that I had to have a really, you know, radical surgery to get it removed. And so you went on to have very invasive surgery, and yeah. then you also had chemo and radiation both? Yeah, I had okay. chemotherapy and radiation because the type of tumor I had was so aggressive that okay. if I didn't do the chemo and the radiation, they said it would most likely metastasize and, mm -hmm. you know, if I would regret not having this done. So. Now, as a young mother, with you've got two gorgeous kids and you're facing your possible, you know, death, I mean, my goodness, I mean, how, how was that? How did you deal with that? <laughs> yeah. I, Impossible question. But, yeah, you know. I, I guess I just, um, I mean, I had to be strong for the kids. I couldn't, I mean, of course I cried, mm -hmm. you know, but not so much in front of them, even though I heard later, like, it is important. Like, the one time I did cry in front of my son because I didn't want to go and get more chemo, he, mm -hmm. I realized that he was staying so strong for me, too. And one day I had tears and he broke down, like, if you're, now I'm crying because you're sad, so now I'm going to cry. And I was like, wow, we've all been being so yeah. kind of happy holding it together, but... Um, 
you know, I just tried to keep things fun and, you know, mm -hmm. like what the reality was so terrible. Like, uh, I just became a really happy, cheerful mom that, you know, bought lots of ice cream and, <laughs> yeah. and like spent a lot of time, like, you know, being, being there when yeah. I could. So. But what I'm hearing is that you're saying there was a certain element of denial to try to keep everything, you know, happy and together for the family. I guess try to keep things as normal as possible, Okay. you know. So, I mean, when it was just the operation, it was like, okay, so it's the first time I'm going to be gone for 10 days or something. But I didn't know that my face would be like so swollen and, and then the way the doctors describe the surgery they make it seem like it's not going to be such a big deal like mm -hmm. it, you know so when I when I asked after they described what was going to happen in this really you know cool tone like oh you're just going to have your face cut open from your lip to your chin to your ear and we'll pull it open and take your jugular out and then put this and you know take part of your wrist and rebuild the inside of your mouth it'll take about 12 hours but you know you'll be fine yeah. and I'm like is this a serious surgery <laughs> possibly like, yes yeah. yeah they're like yes it is but, you know God. we've done it before and, well yeah, yeah, the one we yeah hope. kind of thing God. but, uh, yeah, but until ahead. I had to get the chemo and then I was like oh no I have to and then they didn't know it was cancer for so long because okay because they sent my tumor sample to like the world's most famous pathologist and he said it wasn't cancer. He's like, I don't know what this is. And then, okay. Well, so then, uh, so, I the mean, baldness part, that was when like, okay. you know, that, so that was when I had to tell the kids, yeah, it's cancer, I'm going to be bald. And, okay. You know, I just didn't know what to expect. That's when they were like, wait, cancer? Mm -hmm. And then my aunt had died of cancer just a year ago, so they oh. just associated it with this like, oh, of course, of awful course. kind yeah. of thing. Like. So where, when did you get the idea in the middle of dealing with all of this stuff to return to art and to somehow well, use Well, when that? I was going through cancer, I didn't really have that many um, places. I mean, I had my yoga practice, which was great. My yoga teacher was so supportive. And, and through him and also, you know people that he knew, I you know, was able to sort of invent things for myself that were healing, mm -hmm. but I couldn't find, I would Google cancer art or something, and I couldn't okay. find anything that related to my experience. Okay. You know. Okay. And I so mean, you made your own experience, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, you had a very, very successful Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. And you raised more money than you asked for. Now, what we should say, by the way, for those who don't know about yeah. Kickstarter, is uh, Kickstarter.com is a company based out of Brooklyn, I believe, or certainly yeah. based out of New York. And um, y if you have a cool project, you can submit it to them. They, If they accept it, and clearly they did accept Yukos, then you can try to raise funding for the project. And if you get the funding, then you can keep the money and do your cool project. Now, your project was to rent a studio. Yeah, and make uh, paintings about my experience with cancer. Yeah. Interpreting cancer, I guess. So how about if we look um, at some of your sure, little pieces sure. of art here so far. So I'm going to show one, and then if you could talk about it. Well, when I found out I had cancer, I was like, why did I get cancer? I looked for all these reasons, and that drawing is about my parents and just things that we inherit, like the physical and the emotional stuff. And a lot of times people said, oh, it's just in your DNA, it's genetic. But I went to this one healer, and she told me that I had inherited all of this negative junk from like eons and eons of ancestors and that she, wow. <laughs> but you know, I don't know if it was true, but I just mm. thought of things that are negative and stagnant in my life and cancer is kind of like this, mm -hmm. but very fast growing negative stagnant energy and I'm like, well, I'm going to mm -hmm. do everything I can through Western medicine, but I also need to see how I can approach this on a, you know, in a more spiritual way mm -hmm. see how I can battle on that front as well. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, it's a really, really powerful drawing. Yeah. It's extremely powerful. Let's look at just one more, if we may. Uh, okay. And here we go. It's very uh, powerful as well. So can you talk about this one? That's my hand, because mm -hmm. I had to get um, my, uh, 
you know, the this part of my hand was removed, my wrist, mm -hmm. the tissue and an artery to rebuild the inside of my mouth. And this skin is actually from my thigh. But when I was finally healing from my hand, I still don't really have feeling. I just would get so irritated with this wrist because mm -hmm. it would itch and it would just not feel right and I felt like Darth Vader and <laughs> I, I just was like how like how, can, how do I accept this like okay I'm so mm -hmm. happy I'm alive and I have the inside of my mouth but mm -hmm. it's just really trying to draw like the kind of stress and mm -hmm. anxiety I have about this kind of hand that works but Mm -hmm. isn't the same and just accepting like okay this is me mm -hmm. I mean it's extremely powerful mm -hmm. things how about you Judy when you look at these wow. what do you think well that you can just the the bold red color and and the way it's it it moves there's movement in it too but it looks it does look like there's pain there mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and clearly and, and are was. you right-handed or left-handed I'm right-handed but now since I'm so much more right-handed because this yeah. side doesn't work. It's mm -hmm. just like this kind of like reminder of, I don't know, yeah. of the body not being perfect. Well, it's just perfect in a different way. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, the body like yeah. down. Nobody has a it's perfect It's the new body. you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, you, you have incredibly powerful um, art, I mean, clearly. And uh, as part of this Kickstarter project and the pieces that you have made, are they all paintings and or are some big or some small? Can you tell us um, about some of those? They're mostly your... really big paintings and um, they're about, you know, my, you know, the, the cancer, how I feel about cancer, about what I tried to do, you know, the meditation, the healing mm -hmm. from the meditation and and basically trying to find peace and just learning to grow from, you know, having to go through something that wasn't really fun. Well, it, yeah. sounds, like, it sounds like an incredible thing, and also it's going to be a wonderful exhibition whenever that happens to yeah, be. And so true. if there's anybody out there who wants to host an exhibition, this would be a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful thing to do. And if you want to, you can go to kickstarter.com and just put in Yuko Kodama and her name is at the beginning and also at the end of this segment and then you can see a lot more of Yuko's art. So thank you very much for sharing some of your art with us which was wonderful. And what we would like to do now is to turn to Judy Hennigan and can you tell us a little bit about Martini and Olive and your work with Grant? Yes, well uh, Grant and I, uh, we actually met here in New York when we were both in the 80s when we just started our acting careers and then we both moved to Minneapolis at different times and met up again there and he was doing this lounge uh, personality, Tony Martini, and at one point he approached me and said, do you want to join in? Maybe we could, and I said, hey, I could be Olive, and we became Martini and Olive, and we created these medleys of 70s songs. So it's, uh, it became a satire of the 70s and oh. the music of the 70s, and it grew and grew, and for years we've been doing it. Yeah, all over the place from Minneapolis is, was really our home base mm -hmm. and we would do it every year there mm -hmm. and, and we have dancers and, and a manager and funny security guards <laughs> and all the whole it's just grown into this big funny variety show. Oh super. And, uh, and so actually, Grant and I worked for, together for a long, long time. And we are lucky enough to have a photograph <laughs> of you. This there is a, an original photograph mm -hmm. of Martini and Olive. Our happy faces. And, yeah, when was this photograph taken? Oh my God, I, I, that was probably taken maybe around 1993, maybe. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's an old one. So you were partners with Grant for how long? Yes. Well. I think we started Martini and Olive. I mean, I knew him before this, but I think like in 1992. Okay. So he, he's like a brother to me, and we've been through all mm -hmm. sorts of things. He's he he was an amazing talent, a great actor, mm -hmm. very playful, but very serious and mm -hmm. focused, and and um, about his art, everything he did. It was considered his art, and why I might I come from more of an improvisational background, okay. very serious about his comedy. He was okay. so I think we were a good balance with each other. And, and how was it for you when you got that phone call, or he sat you down and he told you? Yeah, and well, the first time when he first found out that he had colorectal cancer, cancer, um, 
was nine nine ninety nine. Yeah. I remember it because we had planned on. I was staying with him at that mm -hmm. point. We were working on a new show. Mm -hmm. I was in town from L.A. and we were mm -hmm. uh, going to go out and celebrate that it was nine nine ninety nine just for fun. Mm -hmm. And he came home from a doctor's appointment, told me, and uh, everything stopped. Mm -hmm. But he, he always had this great sense of humor about it, and it was very. Uh, sure that he was going to beat this thing and actually that time he did he mm -hmm. he had chemo and radiation it was very intense we had to cancel our show and but he came through it mm -hmm. and it wasn't until um, 98 wait I'm sorry 2008 mm -hmm. yeah 10 years later just about um, yeah that he found out again that it had metastasized this time in his lungs mm -hmm. brain bones oh, God. It, it, and um, and I remember getting that phone call because again we were planning another show mm -hmm. and I was shopping and uh, at this wonderful gift store and I had this really beautifully uh, smelly candle and mm -hmm. he loved smelly candles <laughs> and I was just oh this is great and I got the phone call and it was like what mm -hmm. it's it's back mm -hmm. and um, I yeah. remember buying the candle and that's the candle I always now buy oh. thinking of him and light for him and and yeah, you moved from crazy. L.A. to Minneapolis yeah, for a while to be with Yeah, I was very him. lucky to be in Minneapolis at that time doing another show. Okay. And I got to be with him for months and months as he went through all sorts of treatment and, mm -hmm. and um, operations and the brain and the, all this. And um, so I was really, really lucky to be there. And he was constantly creating. He would always be looking for images. He, he would collect uh, he was a collector and a collector of images and always creating. He was so mm -hmm. passionate about creating and writing and, and performing and directing. He was mm -hmm. such a big mentor to the kids of mm -hmm. Minneapolis St. Paul, mm -hmm. uh, working with kids and so generous with his talent, with his great mm -hmm. talent. And I understand that as he was facing cancer, he wrote this wonderful, wonderful yeah. piece called, is it the rectum monologues? Yes. yes. Yeah. You know, he wanted to write about it. He, he yeah. wanted to be always surrounded by people. He didn't run away from it mm -hmm. or, or he, he just wanted to express himself constantly mm -hmm. and he would always find different ways of doing that. Even when he couldn't write himself, he mm -hmm. would have his sister Elizabeth write it all down for him. Mm -hmm have friends come in and videotape him just telling stories and he really wanted to do a show. Uh -huh. and well, I'm wondering if yes. you could do a little one for us here. I would love to. If you could read an excerpt. From okay, this is, um, it's called Kumbaya and this is when he first find, found out that he had cancer the first time. Okay. We are connected. That connection provides us strength. Strength finally tunes our focus and clarity. Focus and clarity shows us love. We take that love and pass it on. I pass it on to you. My Vicodin-induced prose, composed after 28 days of radiation. Kumbaya, my lord, kumbaya. There is good kumbaya and there is bad kumbaya. Bad kumbaya deals mostly with jute. Good kumbaya is what you rely on to get you through bloody stools. There were a lot of times during my ordeal that I, I picked up that hammer and I walked 500 miles. When you're sick, really sick, stage three sick, I think your mind becomes a bit clearer. It's a little trick and gift from, from above to help you sort things out. All your little concerns are put, put back on the shelf so you can check out the big stuff. Like why was I chosen to experience this life-altering event and not when is the Sears man going to get here? Oh yeah, Bad Kumbaya also deals with white people who use dream catchers for decor purposes. <laughs> Sorry, it's a fact. <laughs> Your mind calms itself. I, I think once you have the answers to symptoms, you can light a relaxation smell candle, take a bath. Have you ever been mellow? Kumbaya. We are all connected. We are all connected. We are all connected. This mantra surfaced in my thoughts one day. Once I took the time to light the candle, musk pine. A simple thought, but an idea direct, fundamental, straightforward. This notion gave me comfort. I had heard the words above, but dismissed them until, well, until I had received my 205 telephone calls from people who had heard from people who had heard from people, people I knew, I didn't know, people who knew people that I knew. A mighty chain of support. Michael rowed that boat ashore. My cancer book was dropped in my lap by a friend.
who heard about it by a friend, who heard about it by a friend, and so forth. Get it? Musk pine. <laughs> Zoom. We are all connected. Six degrees of separation. Hmm. I wondered why I had watched that film 12 times. <laughs> there is comfort there. There is strength. There are a lot of candles to be lit. Campfire songs to be sung. Sometimes now I get sad because those days of candles and connecting are a mere memory. Cancer was nice. Not actually the tumor and all, but I miss sitting and taking the time to sit and look at a picture book. Hmm. That was, um, oh. that was after he was diagnosed as, okay, you're good to go after the whole thing. And, oh. yeah. and just what he took from that experience. And then when he says he misses cancer, um, yeah. <laughs> He was so funny about it because after a while he said, I, I really can't play the cancer card anymore, can I? <laughs> and you yeah, joke about it, but yeah. but that's the thing. He, I think he would forget to remember to stop mm -hmm. and just to cherish, you know, because I mean, he was running at top speed most of the time in his oh, life. It was, it was beautiful. What did you think when, when you heard that? Did that resonate with you in any of your experiences? Um, yeah, definitely, because when you find out you have something that can kill you, you're, mm -hmm. you really don't think about small things, and, mm -hmm. and it is kind of a gift, mm -hmm. because you get to really um, just kind of relax in a way, like, oh, mm -hmm. like I have to enjoy my life now, mm -hmm. not just like you know react to life okay. kind of thing and yeah. and then okay. also you get all these phone calls from people yeah. you've never you <laughs> yeah. haven't heard from yeah. and people just you know look at you like you know like other like in my case like moms like oh yeah. you what know. can i do yeah. what can do something <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 It's really yeah. not I mean, yeah, yeah it's, mm -hmm. it's almost difficult yeah. to accept all of that and just, mm -hmm. you know, but it is a very peaceful time. Like, I almost found that, like, mm -hmm. because I was a mom, like, it was like a chemo vacation, you know, like three days in the hospital. I haven't read a book in years. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I got to read a book from front to end and, you know. Yeah. But, you know, it didn't feel great. No. Yeah, you know, but, yeah. But it does make you slow down and appreciate, mm -hmm. you know, everyone mm -hmm. that you love and mm -hmm. everyone that loves you and mm -hmm. just simple things. Yeah, I could see that. And for me, it's amazing just that very, very short piece just spoke so clearly and brings out so many emotions mm -hmm. and everything. I'm wondering, is there any plan to put this on stage, the rectum monologues? We really hope so, and we're working on it right now. I mean, we should probably check into Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Uh, his sister Elizabeth it has all of his writings, and mm -hmm. she is working right now on uh, mm -hmm. putting them together, and we would love to... Uh, produce it and ha get it up in uh, mm -hmm. Minneapolis where okay. he has such a, a huge community of artists and, and mm -hmm. strong support from all the kids he's taught and directed as mm -hmm. well as all the different shows he's been in and all of his dear friends and partner there and everything so we're hoping that that will be the place to kick it off mm -hmm. and uh, and you got to do it in New York too yes okay. but it would be <laughs> ideal to do it do it everywhere because he yeah. really did want to share this roller coaster that he was on mm -hmm. and he's he uses all sorts of pop references and mm -hmm. stream of consciousness and he was such a a playful yet very focused uh, uh, amazing mm -hmm. man with so many images that I, I just I just love his words now what happened to Martini and Olive when Grant Ritchie died well um, we actually, he wanted us to, he was determined that we would do a show. He died on Thanksgiving, and we mm -hmm. normally open like the day after Thanksgiving oh. for the holiday show. Oh. But he was insistent that we not cancel those shows, mm -hmm. so they became, a, this was in 2009, they became a memorial show mm -hmm. to him. Mm -hmm. And um, I've kind of put it away because uh, this past year has been strange, you mm -hmm. know, dealing with... Uh, saying goodbye and 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 it's weird mm -hmm. but it's starting to resurface now and I, and he was very adamant about mm -hmm. martini and olive continuing mm -hmm. he wanted this it was our baby and he said please keep doing it and so mm -hmm. 
I have to find just the right person, not to replace him, but to mm -hmm. play a character called Martini. Okay. And uh, it'll never be the same, but mm -hmm. we are, we're actually doing it at the Hollywood Fringe Festival oh, this June with a, a different uh, Martini. Oh, and An uh, L.A. cast, not the Minneapolis cast, but it's such a funny show. Uh -huh. and. It's got to live on, and yeah. you know, for yeah. us and for Grant, and, and that's what he wants. So that's great, and I hope to do it again in Minneapolis because we have a huge fan base there, mm -hmm. and New York, and New yeah. York. <laughs> Bring it on. Yes, we've we've actually performed it in New York and Kansas City and Seattle and Orlando. We, you know, so mm -hmm. it's it's a fun fun show. Oh, perfect! I think we might have time just for a short okay. one if oh, you've got Okay, let's one. see if I can. Uh... All right, here we go. This okay. one's called the Dichotomy of Life. We die to make room for the new passengers of the Titanic. I guess some of us have to stay on boat and accept our icebergs we collide into. Will my icebergs ever melt? Okay. But if my icebergs melt, where will the polar bears sit? Oh, man. And uh, can I go on um, a little I, bit? Are we I, good? Maybe for 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Everything went crazy. In my con so confusing state, I missed the Democratic Convention. And once I started taking the steroids, the swelling started to shrink. My haze started to defog. Everything went crazy. My dog Homer had diabetes, urine everywhere. My truck broke down, okay. broken DVD player. That's when everything fell apart yeah. for him. Oh, God. And, uh, and I'm so sorry we'll too. We'll leave it there. <laughs> you have to come see the show yeah, to find out what happened. You have to come see happened. the show to find more. What so, else he says? so I do. Okay. I do apologize oh, for um, cutting you off there. But I'm realizing that we are going to need to end our okay. time today. But. I thank you so much for coming, both you, Coco Dama, and also Judy Hennigan. Now, the bottom line is that if any of you out there are either facing cancer or if you are facing somebody that you love having cancer, then there's a lot of inspiration and there's a lot of motivation that can be found on many levels. Now, clearly, the two women that we have met today, Yuko Kodama and Judy Hennigan, are examples of that. There are people who have experienced this before. There are people whose art can also help you. And um, we thank you so much for having joined us today. And thank you again, Yuko Kodama and Judy Hennigan. Thank you for joining us.